Hello, uh, and welcome back for another video lecture with uh, me, Dr. Scott Spaniel. Uh, today, uh, for Morton College Math 141 Statistics, uh, today we're going to talk about Section 10.3. So in the previous two sections, we talked about uh, the basics of hypothesis testing, and then um, last time uh, we looked at how to do hypothesis tests using class calc for population proportions. So this time uh, we're going to look at a similar idea, uh, but we're going to talk about doing the same thing for um, population means. So you can go ahead and take out your note sheets, which can be found on Blackboard or my Math Lab, and turn to page 13, where we'll get started with section 10.3. So to test hypotheses regarding the population mean, we use the following steps, provided that these things are true. So the first one is the same as was for the proportion, which is the sample has to be obtained using simple random sampling. And then the second one is the sample has no outliers, and the population from which the sample is drawn is normal, or uh, the sample size n is large. Okay, so if the sample size is large, uh, we don't have to worry about these other two points. But if we um, don't know the sample size is large enough, uh, then we'll have to figure out if it has outliers or normal using box plots and normal probability plots, just like we did in chapter nine. So the first step in doing um, these, these steps are almost identical um, as what we've done before, although one of these I should have changed, but anyway, we'll get to that in a second. So determine the null and alternative hypotheses. These hypotheses can be structured in one of the following ways, right? So we've got a the two-tail test, a left-tail test when we're dealing with less than, and then the right-tail test when we're looking at greater than or more. Then you select the level of significance for most of our problems that will be given to you. Uh, then it says use the table of values to estimate the p-value using n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to use technology, just like in the last section. Um, this refers to a really old school way of doing this um, where uh, you use calculus to calculate areas and stuff, but we're not going to worry about that. We're going to use technology, specifically class calc to do these. Uh, just like in the last section, if the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis, and then we state our conclusion. Okay, so let's go ahead and just give one of these a try before we get into the actual application problems. Let's just give, I'll give you the hypotheses, uh, and then we'll try using class calc. So test the hypotheses that mu equals 4.5 or mu is greater than 4.5 from a simple random sample of size n equals 13 is obtained from a population that is known to be normally distributed. Test the hypothesis using the p-value approach at the alpha equals 0.1 level of significance. So first of all, notice our sample is too small to assume we can do hypothesis testing, but we know the population is normal, so therefore we can. Okay. So just like in the last section, we're going to have a, cla um, uh, a uh, class calc function we can use to do this. Um, and similar to the last section, based on the names of these things, you can probably, you might be able to guess what function you're going to use uh, if you look in the menu. In the last section, we used one prop z test, which was the same as one prop, same idea as one prop z int. So in chapter nine, to do uh, confidence intervals, we used a t test. So, in, I mean, a t interval. So in order to do the hypothesis test, you might assume that we're going to use the t test, which you can either find like I just did there or type it out. And it occurs to me, I must have deleted some uh, some of the data I actually wanted to be here because we don't have the mean or standard deviation listed for this problem. Um, so let me just get that real quick, and I'll have to fix that for future semesters. But um, let me find this problem. Yeah, so I deleted the uh, important thing I needed here. So let me go back. The important piece of information we're missing here is that X bar for this problem should be, and now I lost it again, 4.9. Mm -hmm. And S is 1.3. Okay, so those are the other two really important pieces of information we need in order to do the hypothesis test. 
So now we can go back in here and notice it needs mu, which is the value from uh, the null hypothesis. And if you click on this question mark, it'll tell you. It's the population mean uh, from the hypothesis, then the sample mean and sample standard deviation from your sample and the sample size. So in this case, mu is 4.5. Uh, our x bar was 4.9, our s is 1.3, and our sample size was 13. And notice, just like the last one, it gives you um, five pieces of information here. It gives you the p-values. Okay, so in this case, we got p-values of less than is 0 0.8555, greater than is 0 0.1445, and not equal to is 0 0.2890 when I round to four decimal places. And then it also tells us that T is 1.1094 and DOF is 12. Okay, so that's the information the calculator gives us. So now let's talk about what those things mean. So these are our P values depending on which type of test we're doing. So you just wanna pick the one that matches your inequality up here, so greater than, and that's the one you're gonna use, and then you can get rid of the other two. Uh, this number over here is the test statistic. So it is the T-score for the value 4.9 on the distribution with a mean of 4.5 and a standard, uh, the standard deviation we're using is 1.3. Okay, so that's the T-statistic. Um, so if they ask you for the test statistic, we're not going to use it for anything when it comes to doing hypothesis testing, but because of the way my math lab works, it might ask you for that. That's what that is. And then degrees of freedom is simply um, one uh, the n value up here minus one. So they might ask you for that on the homework too. We're not going to use it to actually do the hypothesis testing. Okay. So that's uh, the use for here. So the only thing we need is our p-value, which is 0 0.1445. And the question is, is that less than alpha? In this case, it's not. So that means we would not, do not reject H not, right? Just like in the last section. If P is not less than alpha, we do not reject H not. So same idea as what we did um, in the last section with the given information, okay? So let's go ahead and look at a couple app, uh, actual applications of this where we'll run through the whole thing together. So according to the American Time Use Survey, the typical American spends 154.8 minutes, which is 2.58 hours per day watching television. Do internet users spend less time each day watching television? A survey of 50 internet users results in a mean, uh, I should I'll underline the things uh, that matter, uh, users results in a mean time watching TV of 128.7 minutes per day with a standard deviation of 46.5. Conduct the appropriate Test to determine if internet users spend less time watching television at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. Okay, so the first thing you want to check um, with these is to make sure you can do a t-test. So in this case, we, we want to know is n greater than or equal to 30? And it is, right? Because our n equals 50. So that means we can do a t-test. So we want to set up our hypotheses. Okay, so... Uh, our given was that the average American spends 154.8 minutes per day watching television. Uh, and we want to know, do internet users spend less time watching television? So is their mu less than that 154.8? Okay, by enough, right? Because we can tell 128.7 is less than that, but is it less than, is our sample value far enough less than that to assume it's true for the population? Okay, so now we run our t-test. Okay, because we have all the values we need. So we can go in here and we can just type in T, um, no, not right there. In a new bar, I can type in T test. Oops, except I did it wrong. Sorry, T test. Like that. Um, and notice it has stats or data. We're using stats right now because we have the mean and standard deviation. We'll look at some problems with data here in a minute. Um, we put in our mu, which is 154.8. We put in our mean, which is given in the problem as 128.7. We put in our standard deviation of 46.5 and our sample size of 50. And then just like in the last section, it will calculate our t, uh, t test values. Okay, So in this case, we've got 
four options, right, for p-values. You want to pick the one that matches your inequality. In this case, we're doing less than, so that's the one over here on the left. So our p-value for this problem is 0 0.0001. And then the question is, is that less than alpha? And it is less than alpha, right? Uh, so check, that works. It is less than alpha, so we reject age not, and then we can write a statement about the alternative hypothesis. That's our conclusion. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest internet users spend less time watching television. Okay, and that's the idea of how this works. So very, fairly similar to what we did in the last section. So what I'd like you all to do now is take a moment, pause the video, and try doing this second one. Once you're done, hit play, and we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go through this now. So a Fair Isaac Corporation FICO score is used by credit agencies to assess the credit worthiness of individuals. Its values range from 300 to 850. An individual with a FICO score over 700 is considered to be a quality credit risk. According to the Fair Isaac Corporation, the FICO, the mean FICO score is 703.5. A credit analyst wondered whether high-income individuals, income, incomes in excess of $100,000 per year, had higher credit scores. He obtained a simple random sample of 40 high-income individuals and found that the sample mean credit score to be 714.2 with a standard deviation of 83.2. Conduct the appropriate test to determine if high-income individuals have higher FICO scores at the alpha equals 0.05 level of significance. Okay, so first things first, is n greater than or equal to 30? And the answer to that is yes, because n equals 40. So anytime n is greater than or equal to 30, we can do a t-test, okay, to determine this, okay? So then our hypothesis is, our null hypothesis is that mu equals the population average of 703.5, and our alternative hypothesis is that mu is greater than 703.5, right? Because I didn't underline it, I don't think, but we want to know if they have higher credit scores. Okay, and then, so now we, and we're going to put in our mean and our standard deviation from the sample. So we can flip over here and do a t-test. So I'll just keep going down here and do another one. Our mu was 703.5. Our mean for our sample was 714.2. The standard deviation for our sample is 83.2 and our sample size was 40. And so we pick out the correct one that matches uh, our inequality in our Hypotheses, our inequality in our hypothesis is greater than, so that's this middle one. So our p-value is 0 0.2105. And now we ask ourselves, is 0 0.2105 less than alpha? And the answer to that is no, it is not. So we do not reject H0. So we can say there is not sufficient evidence to suggest high income earners have higher credit scores. Now we can see from the population mean and the sample mean that the average of our sample was bigger. But the problem is it, it wasn't bigger by enough for us to say, to take that information from a sample of 40 people and apply it to the population. Yes, our individual sample did, but in order to be confident in saying that all high income earners have higher credit scores, we want to have a bigger difference. Um, and that difference gets smaller with a bigger sample size. More degrees of freedom means the data all gets sucked closer together, which means you wouldn't need as big a difference between the answers. Okay, so that's how you do this if you're given statistics. If you're given raw data, you can still do the same thing, right? So the U.S. Golf Association 
Uh, USGA requires that golf balls have a diameter of 1.68 inches. To determine if MaxFly XS golf balls conform to USGA standards, a random sample of MaxFly XS golf balls was selected. Their diameters are shown in this table. Because the sample size is small, the engineer must verify the diameter is normally distributed and the sample does not contain outliers. Are the conditions for testing the hypothesis met? So we want to do a box plot for outliers, right, to look for outliers. And we want to go uh, to make sure, let me be clear here with my notes. Box plot, we want to have no outliers. And we want a uh, normal probability plot. To have um, to have an R score greater than the critical value. Okay. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to need to bring up the critical value thing. So let me get that real quick because we'll need that in a second here. Let me see if I can. See if I can find this really quickly. No, not really quickly, but uh, okay. Sorry for this little delay. I should have had this ready to go, but I forgot I needed it. Occurs to me that there's probably a quicker way to do this now. Uh, so I'm actually going to switch what I'm doing and do it this way instead. Yeah, okay, that'll be quicker. Hmm. Maybe it's not going to be quicker than I thought. <laughs> Go back to here because I'm not finding it there. Okay, hold on. I figured out an even quicker way to do this. And actually... Hmm. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay. So this critical value thing that'll show up in all your homework problems, but I don't have it. Uh, anywhere there. So, okay. 
Um, so back to this problem. So I have the data set here uh, in your uh, data set sheet. So I'm going to copy and paste that into class calc. So let me get rid of all these. Okay. Uh, and so the first thing we need to do are the box plot and the normal probability plot. So let's do a box plot of x sub 1 and then zoom in on that. Uh, one of the things, uh, so notice it's really hard to see if I, I need to hit exclude outliers. You can tell there's no outliers because there's no asterisks. But if you want to zoom in better on this, I just need to change my x-axis because it's not, it's giving me too big of a range. So all my values here fall between 1.6 on 1.7. So I'm going to change my axis to go from 1.6 to 1.7. And that gives me a little bit better box plot. Uh, I could zoom in more, but you could tell that there's no outliers. So that's all we're looking for there. So no outliers. i check on that. And then I need to do the normal probability plot. But it isn't called that, so that's why I'm. Yeah, the normal probability plot. I don't know why that didn't come up like that. Oh, because I typed that probability. Anyway, for x sub 1. Uh, and we can look at it if we want. See the graph there is very linear. Uh, but we can also look at the r value. So our r value here equaled. Uh, 0 0.954 for a sample of size 12. So we can go into our critical value list in the thing I built up right here. And we look at 12 is 0 0.928. So for n equals 12, we get 0 0.928. And for the record, I'm in your uh, chapter 9 uh, note sheets. So if you're doing this uh, homework and I'm about to ask you to do one of these, uh, break out those note sheets uh, to find this chart. Okay. So we look at our values here. That worked. And this also works. Our value is greater than that. So that means this thing is approximately normal. So now I can do my t-test. So once I've checked those two things, I can do a t-test on it. So we'll do a t-test. And we want to tell it to look from data, right? That's the difference here. We had done it for statistics, but now we want to do it for data. So um, back in our notes, before we run the t-test, the first thing we have to do is the hypotheses. So in this case, uh, we want, it's required that they have a diameter of 1.68. So to do the balls conform to the USGA standard. So the null hypothesis is that mu equals 1.68. And the alternative hypothesis is that they don't meet that standard so they don't eat 1.68 so when we go in here to do our t-test our mu is 1.68 and then it wants to know where our list is where is our data and our data is in x sub 1 oh and i accidentally put a comma so that's why it's yelling at me so 1.68 and there it'll do it for me so there's all the information i need it tells me the mean and the sample size but all i really care about are these numbers here and the one we care about in this case is this third one because we're doing not equal to. So our p-value is 0 0.4529. Okay, 0.4529. So is that less than alpha at 0 0.05? Nope, it's a lot bigger. So that means we do not reject the null hypothesis. And we conclude, conclude there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the balls are not, uh, do not, not are not, do not have a diameter of 1.68 inches. Okay. So that's the idea there. Okay, so what I'd like you all to do now is pause the video, take some time, and try doing this video, uh, doing this second problem on your own using the stuff we just looked at. Uh, and then when you're done, hit play, and we'll go over it together. Okay, 
So now that you've had a chance to try this on your own, let's go through it together. So the mean waiting time at a drive through of a food restaurant from the time an order is placed to the time the order is received is 84.3 seconds. A manager devises a new drive through system at his restaurant and measures the wait time for 10 randomly selected orders. The wait times are provided in the table. Because the sample size is small, the bo manager must verify the wait times are normally distributed. Are the conditions met? So does the box plot have no outliers? And then we want to look at the normal probability plot at its uh, R needs to be greater than the critical value. So we get with n equal to 10. So we could start off by finding that critical value. So if we look in the uh, table, this will be provided for you on the homework, but in the table in our chapter 9 notes for 10, we have 0 0.918 is the R value we're looking for. So we're looking for R to be greater than that. So now let's look at these graphs. So I'm going to copy from our uh, data sheet sets Google Sheet. I'm going to copy and paste the data that I typed in there earlier. Okay. Then let's get rid of all the stuff we were doing earlier. Although, oh well. So then we can put uh, our data in there. And so now I want to do a box plot at x sub 1. So let's take a look at that. And we can see if we exclude outliers, uh, nothing happens. So there are no outliers. So that's good. Well, let's zoom in again just to make sure. Yep. And then we want to do a normal probability plot for x1. And we can look at it and see that this is fairly normal looking, right? Fairly close to that uh, line. And it has an R value of 0 0.969. So the box plot had no outliers. Check. R is greater than the critical value, so check. So we're all good to use a t-test here. Okay. So we can write our hypotheses. So in this case, H0 is mu equals 84.3, what it used to be, 84.3 seconds. And the alternative hypothesis is that mu is less than that, right? To be more effective means quicker in this context. So that's why we're going to do less than. So now we can do a t-test for data with a mean of 84.3 and using the data in x sub 1. And we get these t-test results. And we want to use the first one, right? Because we're doing less than. So our p-value is 0 0.1113. So is 0 0.1113 less than alpha? And the answer to that is no, it's not, right? It's close, but it's not less than that. So we do not reject H0. And so there is not sufficient evidence of the alternative, of the alternative hypothesis, which is that to, uh, to suggest the new method is more effective. Okay. And that's the idea. So that's how we can do t-tests with data. So we can do t-tests when we already have the statistics. We can do t-tests when we have the raw data. Um, notice if I had a all if I had the raw data, but my sample size was bigger, 30 or bigger, I wouldn't have to do these steps, right? These steps were only because n was less than 30. If n is greater than or equal to 30, I can do these bottom steps without having to do the middle stuff there. So that's the idea. So now the last thing in this section is similar to what we did before, which is that when we have not equal to, so mu not equal to mu, mu not, we can use confidence intervals to do hypothesis tests. You don't have to. You can use a t-test still, but we can't. So for example, in 2002, the mean age of an inmate on death row was 40.7 years, according to data obtained from the U.S. Justice Department. A sociologist wondered whether the mean age of death row inmates has changed since then. She randomly selected 32 death row inmates and found their mean age to be 38.9 with a standard deviation of 9.6. Construct a 95% confidence interval about the mean age. 
What does this interval imply? Okay. So our sociologist wants to know, is the mean age still 40.7 or has, do we have enough statistical evidence that it is no longer 40.7? We can make a confidence interval or uh, do a t-test because n is greater than or equal to 30, right? In this case, n is 32. So in this case, they want us to do a confidence interval, which is what we did back in chapter 9. So if we go to class calc, and I'll get rid of all this stuff that we don't need anymore, we can do a t-interval instead of a t-test, and we put in our mean, which was... 38.9 was our X bar, our sample mean. Put in our sample standard deviation of 9.6. Put in our sample size, which is 32, and our um, confidence level, which is 95%, so 0.95. And when we do that, we get a confidence interval of 35.4 to 42.4 years of age. So what does that confidence interval tell us? Well, is our population mean in that? Yes, this is in here, so that means we do not reject. If the mean had not changed, that's what we would expect to happen. We would expect our confidence interval to have our mean in it. So we do not reject, so there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the mean age of death row inmates has changed. Okay, so that's the idea. So go ahead and pause the video once again for a moment. Try making a confidence interval for this one and see what you think. And then when you hit play, we'll talk about it. Okay, so now you've tried this one. In 2001, the mean household expenditure for energy was $1,493, according to data obtained from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. An economist wanted to know whether this amount was changed significantly from its 2001 level. In a random sample of 35 households, he found that the mean expenditure in 2001 dollars for energy during the most recent year was $1,618 with a standard deviation of 321. Construct a 95% confidence interval about the mean energy expenditure. What does the interval imply? So in this case, he wants to know, is the mean still 1,493 or has it changed? Okay, so we can make a confidence interval to deal to take a look at how that works okay because our n is greater than or equal to 30 at n equals 35 okay so we can make a t interval so we can do the same thing we just did do a t interval all right and we can put in our mean which is of his sample was 1618 1618 with a standard deviation of 321 dollars a sample size of 35, and a confidence level of 90.95, 95%. So in this case, we got $1,508, rounded to the nearest dollar, to $1,728 is our interval, like this. So is 1493 in there? No. So we can reject H0, because it's not in there, and if this was still true, if this was still the mean, we would expect it to be in our interval. So we can say there is sufficient evidence to suggest the mean energy, ex energy expenditure is different than in 2001. Oh. Okay, so that's it for uh, this video lecture. Uh, in the last section of um, chapter 10, which we'll do in the next video lecture that we're going to cover is section 10.5. 
Uh, we'll talk about putting this all together. So which method do you choose and how do you choose it and all that good stuff. Um, and then that'll be it for chapter 10. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message on email or remind, uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. But otherwise, have a good one, and we'll see you for the next video.